Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Neha Singh, and on behalf of IIP Raigarh, welcome you all for today's CME. Friend, today, nineteenth April, is observed as World Liver Day, and IIP Raigarh, celebrating the day, has arranged a special panel discussion to raise awareness about the liver-related disorders and diseases in children. I would like to invite our uh, president, Dr. Pramod Vankade sir, vice president, Dr. Vikas Mohre sir, and secretary, Dr. Dhaninjay Shah sir, uh, Dhaninjay Rajput sir, to uh, the program, and request Dr. Vikas Mohre sir to say a few words. Welcome, sir. Uh, yeah, Pramod sir has joined, so we can give the address. So you can continue, Vikas. No problem. Okay, fine. So uh, welcome everyone on the behalf of IIP Raigarh on this. Uh, i will say auspicious world liver day we know the importance of uh, liver in our body and uh, uh, the children has suffered from various liver diseases uh, the basic uh, idea of uh, behind having this aim is that to uh, enlighten all delegates regarding the day to day uh, liver diseases which uh, are there in the children and what are the recent advances being happening in this area so uh, i am so happy to have dr vishnu virada who is my very co close friend from jj hospital uh, he practices in pune and uh, dr vibhav bokar is another very good friend from mumbai they are excellent gastroenterologists uh, i would like to so honor to have both of them to uh, be uh, with us to enlighten us regarding this very very important cme uh, i congratulate uh, ip raigad for having this cme and thankful to all delegates for participating in this neha you can continue yes sir thank you sir uh friends as uh, sir has already enlightened the topic for today's panel discussion is recent advances in management of liver disorder in children and the panelists for today's program is dr vishnu varada sir and dr vibhor sir uh Dr. Vishnu Viradhar sir is a consultant pediatric gastroenterologist, hematologist, and endoscopist. Uh, he is working at present at Kamal uh, Endoscopic Center, Pune, and Jupiter Hospital, Pune. He has many paper presentations and poster presentations in international level, and many publications in national and international platforms. And Dr. Vibhor sir uh, has done his MBBS from said GS Medical College and KM Hospital. mumbai uh, md pediatrics from pgi chandigarh super speciality in pediatric gastroenterology from sg pgi lucknow uh, sir is a director of uh, pediatric hepatology and gastroenterology center of liver intestine and pancreas transplant at nanavati max super speciality hospital uh, sir has also many paper presentations public uh, publications at national and international level he is also reviewer of many journals at national and international level and uh, today's program moderator is dr uh, rajendra chandurkar sir as moderator of the program he was past president of ip raigarh at present he is editor at board maharashtra and ip and raigarh ip he is practicing now in uh, alibag raigarh over to you sir thank you dr neha neha just just a minute neha yes hello please. yes sir yes sir uh, raja just yes before please. before we begin uh, i just uh, extend my best wishes on the on behalf of world liver day to all thank you very much thank you, thank you sir yes sir over to yes. chandu sir yes uh, thank you uh, dr neha uh, good evening friends respected faculties dr vibhor borkar dr vishnu biradar my senior colleagues and delegate friends on this virtual platform at the outset i sincerely thank uh, the organizers of our iip raigarh and specifically dr pramod ji vankhede sir and vikas more for giving this wonderful opportunity to me to moderate this session on advances recent advances in management of liver problems in children with two eminent and prominent pediatric gastroenterologists and hepatologists hepatologists in our region i would not say them as or call them as budding uh, hepatologists but i would call them as established hepatologists of our region and it's a proud moment for me 
to be associated with them. I remember we had uh, one or two CMEs related to this topic, liver disorders, but those uh, uh, CMEs were related to common office uh, practice problems of liver in children. And uh, uh, in those CMEs, commoner issues like liver function tests and other issues were uh, covered. So uh, we thought, why not have a panel discussion related to advances in recent management of various liver problems. And there the idea came in picture. Friends, in office or day-to-day -day practice, acute infectious hepatitis is the one problem which all of us commonly face in our office practice. But there are various other disorders like metabolic liver problems, cholestasis, biliary atresia, undiagnosed liver problems, and tumors uh, in the liver. So these are various problems which very often we don't discuss. And at times, the relatives, they ask about the prognosis of these disorders. They ask about the progress of these disorders. They ask about cost of the therapy in such disorders. At times, they also ask about liver biopsy. They ask about uh, liver transplantation cost of liver transplantation, various centers where liver transplantation is done. And at times we are uh, not able to answer them uh, properly or adequately. And we, we uh, at times don't satisfy them. So I hope in this CME, uh, we would gather the related information from both the eminent speakers and faculties. I uh, would like to quote over here that some three years back before pandemic, we had organized one CME, uh, and in that CME, one topic was liver function test and clinical correlation with uh, uh, various liver problems. And it was held at Fountain, Fountainhead Hotel in Alibag. And I got the opportunity somehow with uh, uh, Dr. Mohite sir to share the platform in that physical CME, where I spoke on liver function test and its clinical application in clinical practice. So uh, with this brief introduction, I would uh, like to say that uh, this uh, session, we would try to make it very lively, as lively as I, I uh, uh, make lively sessions in my chai with Dr. Sandorkar in various sessions, those are academic or non-academic sessions. So it would be more or less likely a chai with Dr. Sandorkar session on behalf of IAP Raigad. Of course, the chai is not there. Uh, have we arranged chai, Dr. Pramod Vankide sir, on this virtual platform? No, I don't see cups and things. <laughs> Anyways, anyway, so I would like to share uh, the presentation, which, of course, Dr. Vibor uh, sir has. Uh... <laughs> you're right, you're right. <laughs> yes, Dr. Vibor sir has only provided to me, and uh, it was so neat and clean that I. Uh, it was not. I mean, editing was need, not needed in that. So I share the uh, case scenarios. Basically, it will be a practically oriented case scenarios. And we will, have, we will be having a fair discussion on uh, each cases. Yes, case one. It's a five-week-old uh, baby boy presented with jaundice and pigmented high-colored urine, pale stool since, uh, since last 10 days of life. Since 10 days of life. There was no abdominal distension. There was no bleeding from any other side. There was no irritability. No cataract, no dysmorphism. But hepatosplenomegaly was there. And it was a suspected case of biliary atresia. So I would first go to Dr. Vishnu, sir, and ask him 
how would you investigate the child of neonatal cholestasis uh it is very important uh, topic which we have started with and i think neonatal cholestasis is the topic where uh, uh, where your clinical acumen along with your uh, little bit of of i would say uh, uh, thinking should be there so what i will do is first ask about the stool color okay so the stool color is the most important part in the investigation of the uh, 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 in the uh, evaluation of the neonatal cholestasis okay and after that the is the child thriving well or not okay so yes. if the child is thriving well then we think about the biliary diseases like biliary atresia and pfic and this group is almost 60% of our cause of neonatal cholestasis rest of the 20 or 30% group will involve the other causes and uh, that that will be depending on is the child sick or not sick right the infective causes like torch infections or any mm-hmm. other infections like uti are very very small percentage less than 5% okay but they, they there in that case the child would be sick right the child will be sick and yes. there will be other Uh, right. Associated symptoms will be there. Yes. So the biliary atresia is the most commonest, followed by the PFIC. Okay. Yeah. What is the role of HIDA scan in such patients? Okay. So what I will do is when when I see the child having a pale stool, that means the bile is not coming properly in the intestine. right okay and what the hida scan will provide me is that the 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 hida is coming in the intestine or not but that will not define the the cause of the uh, cholestasis so okay. instead of putting the money in the hida or wasting the time on the hida scan okay two important investigations i would like to do yes. one is ggt along okay. with your complete liver function test Right. and the second is pti right and whenever i see a child of neonatal cholestasis before doing any test the first prescription or the first step what i do is give vitamin k 5 mg okay when you see a neonatal cholestasis before ordering any test give vitamin k because vitamin k deficiency leading to a bleeding particularly intracranial bleed is very high on uh, in the patients of neonatal cholestasis so the first step is is the stool pale or not okay second is to give the vitamin k right or order liver function test along with ggt and okay. pti this right. is how i i am going to investigate this children how how significant it is to uh, combine ggt and uh, alp like they say don't rely only on ggt you have to combine uh both this test and then uh, interpret uh, as far as cholestasis go right so if you have a vitamin d deficiency the alp will go high but okay. ggt will not okay but if the ggt is high that yeah. means there is a biliary epithelial damage so okay. biliary epithelial damage happens in two or three conditions okay. one is biliary atresia second yeah. is allergy syndrome third okay. is your primary sclerosing cholangitis yeah. and fourth is mdr3 deficiency pfic type 3 so if the ggt is high then my suspicion is different if ggt okay. is normal or low my suspicion will be on the pfic or bile axis synthetic defect so the most important investigation in neonatal cholestasis is clicking the picture of the stool second okay. doing the ggt and right. third ptinr along with that give the vitamin k if we can do this much to the neonatal cholestasis we are preventing the bleeding also and we are segregating them in basket and then that basket will give us a clue that what this is the patient has great has sonography got any role in uh, patients of cholestasis i mean as investigation of choice yes so the sonography only provide two uh, uh, probably two or three uh, answers okay one is the cbd dilated or not okay so yes. that 
confirms or rules out the political system. Right. And the second important thing which I want from the sonography is right. what is the gallbladder length? Okay. When the child is fasting, right. and what is the gallbladder volume? Okay. And see that after feeding, this gallbladder volume is getting contracted or not. Okay. These are the only two or three questions I need from the ultrasound. And okay. we need to talk to the ultrasonologist that right. I need only these two answers. Okay. I don't need liver is enlarged or not. I don't need spleen is enlarged or not. We okay. can detect that or see that in the uh, in the clinically. But what right. I want extra is these two, uh, two things. Okay. Okay. And what is the role of liver biopsy in unity cholestasis? When I started the practice 12 years back, so we used to do the liver biopsy in all cases to right. differentiate what kind of uh, disease this child is having. But to me, uh, probably with the experience, we know that is this patient biliary atresia or not. Okay. But to me, liver biopsy in neonatal cholestasis in current era okay. is only to diagnose biliary atresia, sclerosing right. cholangitis, okay. ruling out Langerhans cell histocytosis. And in rest, all the conditions, probably, we, we don't need a liver biopsy. Okay. So nowadays, we are going away from the liver biopsy. Okay. Uh, is there any change in previously predicted uh, algorithm of evaluation of neonatal cholestasis? It's a massive change. Means okay. what we used to do yes. is every child, we used to see that, key, is it liver failure? Is it not liver failure? Right. do a lot of tests and then come to the conclusion. At yes. present, only three tests are important for me. Okay. Or maybe four tests. Okay. One that GGT and PTI. Right. Second, ultrasound to rule out the colloidal cyst and see right. the gallbladder length. Third test is that liver biopsy when I'm suspecting biliary atresia. Okay. Fourth test is hmm. the clinical exam or whole exam sequence look for the cause of neonatal cholestasis other than the biliary atresia okay. and probably a last slide would be on the urine mass spectroscopy so okay. this is okay. the uh, in nutshell if okay. we will go step by step right hypocolic stool a colic okay. stool yes if it is not present mm. then i rely on the ggt okay if it is low okay. we do the serum bile acid okay. if the serum bile acid is normal or low then right. we think about bile acid synthetic defect. Okay. If GGT level is low, but there is high serum bile acid, we straight away go to the clinical exam sequence. Okay. If GGT is high, we go to the clinical exam sequence. Okay. But if there is a colic stool, hmm. we don't see alpha-1 antidepressin deficiency and cystic fibrosis in our population. Okay. If the child is less than 60 days, hmm. then we do liver biopsy, okay. see that he, is it a biliary atresia or not. Mm. If the child is more than six weeks or okay. less than four weeks, right. we straight away go for the peroperative cholangiogram. Okay. Because okay. doing a liver biopsy will waste of the time. So straight away I'm going to the uh, uh, cholangiography and diagnosis. So only four or five things are there. So okay. we don't mingle around and it is very straightforward nowadays. Right. Right. And as far as our country is concerned, what are the commonly diagnosed uh, uh, etiological fa uh, uh, facts in neonatal cholestasis? I mean, uh, what are the etiological causes of neonatal cholestasis in India, per se? Yes. So, if if any child come to me and if I blindly say this is biliary atresia, okay. I am 35% correct. Or okay. if I say PFIC, I am again 30% correct. So, okay. most common is biliary atresia. Biliary atresia. Most common is PFIC. Okay. The third commoner causes will be the allergy or uh, 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 tyrosinemia and galactosemia. Right. And the other causes are very, very rare. Because I have yet to see a patient of purely CMV hepatitis. Okay. I have yet to see a patient of herpes simplex right. with acute liver failure. So right. these are very, very less common causes. And, and, and how about uh, familial cholangitis and uh, benign, benign uh, recurrent... Uh, uh, call angiopathy. I mean, put some light on that, those things. Uh, do we see such patients? Yes. So the first common group, group is biliary atresia. Okay. Second common is PFIC is progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. Okay. So that progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis right. group 
Initially, we used to say only three conditions: one, mm -hmm. two, three. Now okay. it is one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. and it is almost a thirty percent of the uh, neonatal cholestasis is because of PFIC. And okay. in this group, only the uh, uh, GGT will be normal or low. So okay. that will def define that it is PFIC or biliary atresia. Okay. Now I uh, move on and. I would uh, like to ask this uh, or discuss this case with Dr. Vivo. Uh, patient is seven years old girl. It is the first episode of jaundice for far past seven days. It preceded by two days of fever, nausea, and non bilious vomiting. Urine was high colored. There was no altered sensorium, pleuritis, or abdominal distension. There was no history of any drug intake, family history of liver disease. On examination, there was mild tenderness. Liver three centimeter form. Regular margin and round border, spleen not palpable, no ascites. How would you go about for this case? What are the possibilities, Doctor Vipo? So, if looking at uh, this uh, history, it's a short history. Right. First episode, child clinically stable, right. only liver is there, spleen not palpable. Yes. So this tells me about the acute presentation. Right. Of course, all the liver, uh, chronic liver disease is also present sometimes at the first time. Right. So, uh, but if you see the anthropometer is normal, most phenomenally with jaundice, if there is visible jaundice in CLD, you will get decompensation. Also. So, when they are not there, we are fairly probably confident that probably we are dealing with the acute hepatitis. Right. Till we have not done investigation, we will call it as an acute hepatitis. Uh, but a later, so but the most common cause is yes. with us now is basically viral hepatitis, hepatitis right. A and hepatitis E. Right. Uh, these are the most common causes. Yes. After that, uh, medicine induced, drug induced uh, liver uh, injuries like uh, tubercular drug induced, paracetamol one, anti epileptic medication right. induced. These may, uh, or uh, allo, uh, other alternative medicine uh, related one. So okay. these are also the uh, commonly found one. Now, in indeterminate uh, hepatitis are also very common. With uh, so probably there is some uh, if we come to an urban population with the advent of an hepatitis A vaccination and with yes. uh, water supply and hygienic practices, the uh, like A and E. Practically speaking, I am seeing less number of cases in la last uh, three to four years. And yes. there is a group of other diseases like indeterminate hepatitis, which is rising up. Gradually, probably we are going to follow uh, the statistics of the West also. Maybe it's too early to comment still. Now we are seeing like a six month old baby is also with the indeterminate hepatitis. Now recently also the adenovirus hepatitis there in the West after the COVID infection in the UK is going on. Yes. Uh, so yes, the other uh, possibilities also we should keep in mind. Till now, most common with us is an acute viral hepatitis followed by medication. For all practical purposes, it is is it is it important to uh, know whether it is hepatitis A or hepatitis E? Because especially in our remote areas like Aliba, Manka, Mahar, in this district, uh, I mean, cost effectiveness we have to look at. Look at. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not willing to do it. I mean, how it how important it is to know whether it is this is hepatitis A or hepatitis E? So, uh, once we have a child with hepatitis, so 80% of the hepatitis are unictic. Okay. That's with hepatitis A. Right. If I'm seeing a child who is stable, so in ideal okay. situation, we should investigate and we should know the cause. That's an ideal situation. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. We, are, we are deviating from right. basically want to tailor-made our uh, OPD practices depending on our right. social circumstances. Yes. We are getting a hepatitis where it is an unictic hepatitis. Mostly, right. this will resolve and uh, we can wait in terms of doing an etiological workup. Okay. But if the patient is getting recurrent hepatitis, if child is have a visible jaundice, it means right. that a significant damage. Here you should know the etiology because right. the liver has a quite uh, is a favoring organ. This tells a fifty percent of liver is not damaged. You are okay. not getting a hepatitis uh, jaundice. Right. So if you know there is a jaundice, here the disease can progress. And right. knowing the etiology can help us to prognosticate the patient. Right, right. Can help us know how frequently we can follow. So, yes. getting a ictery hepatitis, then you must do etiology. 
Okay, yes, that's why I want the, the point was uh, a prognosis wise, uh, how the difference between hepatitis A infection and hepatitis E infection as far as prognosis of both the diseases is concerned. So, in both in the pediatric age group, it's not that one is more harmful than the other, that one is more okay. associated with the liver failure. It's not like that. Okay. In uh, pregnancy, yes, hepatitis E has a poor prognosis compared to if, uh, the other causes of uh, uh, hepatitis. But in pediatric age group, they are equal, uh, equally bad or equally right. good, what I'll say, uh, compared to other etiology of hepatitis B and all. Yes, the acute hepatitis B can be problematic and sometimes they come with liver failure and they're quite uh, rapidly deteriorate. So, hepatitis, acute hepatitis B is something we should be aware of. Right. Yes, Dr. Vishnu, uh, in such patients of acute uh, presented hepatitis patients, what, what investigations do we refer to? So, the, uh, the investigations are pretty common, but what I would like to emphasize that doing SGOT, SGPT is not a correct way of going ahead with the liver function test. Okay. So, the SGOT, SGPT, what they indicate is the hepatocyte injury. Damage. Okay. What we are interested is the excretory function of the liver also right. like bilirubin and right. synthetic function of the liver also that is right. protein albumin and albumin and iron, iron. Yes. yes and also alkaline phosphatase and ggt because right. what happens is if we have an indeterminate cause as right. was the uh, nowadays we are seeing a lot of cases of indeterminate hepatitis so the ggt helps in deciding that is it drug induced or something like in the in the adult they see for the alcohol, but yes. GGT is also an important part of the liver function test. Okay. And if you see that the bilirubin is high, then, or if you see that the child is little bit irritable, then doing a PTINR always helps a baseline PTINR so that we can monitor that, that this PT is getting corrected or getting worsened. So the okay. baseline PTINR liver function test along with GGT is is i think is must in all the liver all the liver diseases you cannot get away from the ggt and ptnr in patients of liver disease etiological workup as mentioned hav is less common but still we see uh, is number one cause of hepatitis if hav and hev is yes. negative then in appropriate clinical setting we order dengue igm and depending on the case-to-case -case basis, like uh, uh, like Vibor mentioned that we see a lot of patients with acute presentation of Wilson, autoimmune liver disease, bird cherry. So in appropriate setting, that investigation need to be carried on. But the basic, what uh, should be the uh, the point we should be taking away is PTINR and complete liver function test is must. And etiological workup, you can send later also. If the right. child is deteriorating, then yes. you can see that what etiology is there. But PTINR and the, the all complete liver function is must. Right. Uh, say, suppose this patient of acute hepatitis is admitted indoor in our peripheral setup and uh, he is going to be there for, for uh, supportive management. How do we uh, monitor such patients in wards? Like if the patient is going to stay for, say, a week or so, how do we monitor? So I think four four or five things we should be uh, uh, documenting every time we see the child right one uh, is the child is encephalopathic or not yes two what is the liver span this child is having at present so morning liver span of 7 cm or 8 cm or 11 cm and evening if the liver span is becoming 7 cm then that means we are in some problem real okay. problem so yes. the liver span is very important yes. and uh, uh, signs of encephalopathy is very important. And the third important thing is the glucose level. Right. Because what will happen is the hypoglycemia is the most important part that the, is the child is having a, a, a adequate reserves or not. Right. So if there is a hypoglycemia, we should not miss hypoglycemia. So these children should be on the IV fluids plus oral fluid if they are tolerating because a lot of these children vomiting out. So they don't tolerate orally. So the fluid with dextrose is must in all patients of acute viral hepatitis, glucose, encephalopathy, and 
the liver span is must okay dr vibor uh, such patient is patient is admitted with us and uh, we uh, at times have to take decision when to refer either to you to uh, or to dr vishnu so uh, if we wish to transfer such patient for your opinion what would be the criteria to refer the patient of acute hepatitis to a pediatric gastroenterologist okay so when the child is admitted so the child with hepatitis can be admitted one thing is they can have a very poor oral intake which is related to hepatitis and the uh, acolic uh, or calculus cholangiitis right so this can be managed by giving iv fluids for few days and gradually establishing the oral intake yes now so for that for acute for a poor intake we don't uh, so this can be easily managed but what we are worried about the progression right. that clinically the child is getting encephalopathy grade yes. 1 encephalopathy can be a number of reasons like right. hypoglycemia not eaten well dehydrated sometimes yes. hydration also it can improve the mentation status yes. so we correct all these things if you are getting active grade 1 to 2 encephalopathy right. now inr so if your inr is increasing most of the liver diseases will have increased bilirubin and inr derangement after vitamin k so inr is going more than 2 it means that it can progress further and there you should refer it uh, further uh, albumin coming down so we know that generally it's uh, of a very long half life it is possible that there can be some uh, uh, chronic liver disease so it can be acute on chronic liver disease or it can be uh, uh, it can be like a severe one where the synthetic function is really going down of a uh, two or uh, two weeks also if there is a acute liver failure the albumin may go down even alf so so bilirubin is quite a very good prognostic marker so uh, so bilirubin is going down 10 probably child is worsening of course exceptions are the cholestatic phases and if you are getting an ascites uh, then again it's a red flag Uh, even uh, rarely in acute hepatitis also you can get an ascites but they are different cases if you are so if you are getting an ascites then probably again underlying chronic liver disease can be there so in such cases you should refer this patient to the uh, specialist yes what should be the diet for a child with acute hepatitis dr vibor so it is very uh, important aspect because uh, here uh, there are a lot of uh, misconceptions about the diet most common misconception is once the jaundice is there they should stop anything which looks yellow okay so not giving turmeric so again anything which is like stopping the dal uh, so these are these are the common practices after that the another common practices is giving a fruit juices or the right. uh, neka juice sugar cane juices are given right. another common misconception are giving a totally bland diet stopping oil and uh, stopping all masalas so okay. these are basically commonly practiced thing now there is no so what first we'll see whether it is scientifically is correct or not so right. all this all the turmeric oil so this liver is not required for there is a pancreatic function for the oil digestion and all so you can safely give oil giving oil turmeric and spices they are not going to damage the liver that's the first thing so it's not required now what is the harm of giving this one thing it decreases the palatability of the food so the child anyway who is poor oral intake because of nausea and all plus you are giving them very bland diet so child will lose weight second thing by giving juices and all which is from uh, you are purchasing from any local vendor so already flies and all in the city so of course high, further food hygiene can be compromised already hepatitis a some has been uh, transmitted by a fecal route and you are again given a chance by some uh, so so there is another chances of another uh, infection like a typhoid or uh, or any food poisoning so this can happen so uh, absolutely this practices are not required again limiting the salt is also not required so we should give their normal diet any a uh, pre illness a uh, diet which was going on family can take that diet so home made freshly prepared culturally acceptable diet should be given to the child 
okay i would again come uh, to two liquids and one of them is ganneka juice he said don't give and we often recommend that uh, all of us basically so why why uh, did you say that you don't uh, i would get that yeah so i said two points one mm-hmm. the ganneka juice is a total fructose one right so if on an empty stomach you give such a high uh, osmolality food the, it will increase the nausea so there will be okay. more vomiting and you will think okay to okay. better to recover any or i and so so it will delay actually the establishment of the enteral uh, field that is the one thing okay. plus ganneka do some there will be lot of flies will be sitting over there it's a quite sweet it attracts flies and that is another source of yes, another, yes, so another infection transmission a concomitant uh, another yes. gastrointestinal infection yes and absolutely yes. zero protein <laughs> yes. yes okay and another liquid how how safe it is to give uh, coconut water in such patients like this have it of safe. giving uh, coconut water to all yeah. patients sick patients how safe it is to give uh, coconut water to uh, hepatitis patients it is so, safe there is no harm one can give it yes uh, but uh, means it should not be a major part of the nutrition right uh, yes dr vishnu uh, when should we refer the child of yes i, I would rather ask this question to uh, dr vipor when should we refer this ch- child of acute liver failure to transplant center so uh, once uh, uh, we one thing is progressive encephalopathy right uh, so that one so you are getting even the grade 2 encephalopathy child is irritable you are de- probably you are requiring sedation yes so then yes definitely the child uh, can further progress and in such children may not give us the chance to refer if the encephalopathy progresses further another uh, the thing is if uh, the inr uh, is quite high is more than 4 another thing that we are requiring vasopressor because we will be seeing further that when the liver is once it is got necros is a state of sars in that surge you will need more sometimes inotrop the inotropic requirement tells that okay probably liver is failing so any uh, acute kidney injury if you are getting a little bit of an acute lung injury there are the cases uh, where probably it is a progressive liver disease and it will need a significant uh, intensive care management to salvage the patient uh before i come to this question i would ask i would like to ask one question to uh dr vishnu uh, i mean we have got uh, hepatitis a vaccine and it is my personal observation that uh, uh, practicing for past 23 years and giving after giving hepatitis a vaccine the prevalence or incidence of hepatitis a in this region has gone down of course when we face epidemic situation patients rise but uh, but uh, uh, are there any research is going on as far as hepatitis e vaccine is concerned vaccine against hepatitis e infection because that is also very horrifying infection as uh, especially when the epidemics are there i i think problem with hepatitis e is the antigenicity means once you give the vaccine the, the vaccine should be having a good antigenicity and the yes. problem with the hepatitis e is that you get a hepatitis e once and you are not going to have this uh, Im- uh, antibodies for the life long so that is why hepatitis e can be there repeatedly once once you are having hepatitis e infection okay you develop the antibody and okay. that antibody lasts only for 5 to 6 years and that okay. is why you are prone to have a hepatitis e again okay so that is the problem with the hepatitis e that the antigenicity right. is not good and that okay. is why we are not getting a good vaccines for Vaccine. the hepatitis e. yes yes thank you dr vishnu uh, dr vibor how should we how should the child with acute liver fail, failure should be managed so um uh, we have just seen that this child with hepatitis uh, any hepatitis because it is a one organ is failing yeah. and we know that homeostasis in the body is that all the systems are in balance that's what we call homeostasis so when your one organ is failing definitely is going to pull down all the other all organs so nice. maintaining the hemodynamic status not only liver but also all the other organs is right. very important and such kind of patients will need very round the clock monitoring 
and at the same time we see what are the uh, uh, basically uh, parameters which are deranged beyond a particular uh, acceptable criteria or limit if they beyond that then we put a red flag on that okay this is a danger sign so there are the prognostic models for that so there are different yes. different scores like in college criteria failed score or there are some indian uh, studies also and on that then we uh, basically prime them about the prognostication of the what percentage of the mortality will be yes. and then this questions basically we plan for a uh, basically a, we uh, do a work of our liver transplant now planning for a transplant is not same as the performing that is very important many of the uh, liver so liver failure patients if they are managed well given a good support once uh, they can the liver can regenerate also so maintaining is that the maintaining the homeostasis of the all the organ system should be or overall metabolic and hemodynamic uh, hemodynamic stability so that we uh, produce a favorable condition for the liver regeneration that is the aim in the management and then we see after doing that also suppose the liver damage is progressing then one can go with the transplant if the liver is recovered it's not needed but why we want them to refer earlier age is then we get a head of time to act because it needs a lot of uh, uh, work of donor selection government permission fund raising so that's why uh, it's always better to refer a child whether when the child actually is a stable state Uh, so different steps will be just stabilize maintain so a b c so protect airway if the child has grade to even referring is better to intubate and refer because they can worsen while the transfer maintain good hydr uh, uh, basically hydration maintaining normal electrolytes if sodium is low we give to, to, to we will raise it with the 3% sodium but once it is crosses around 145 Then you should stop it because the child will go in a hypernatremia. Then again, will another problem is there. Minimum enteric fluids is okay. Again, the prevention of bleeding is very important, but it doesn't mean that we should just give on uh, blood products, prophylactic antibiotics. Then also measures to reduce uh, intracranial pressure, giving minimal medications, uh, uh, and and just the preparing. This is the basically the uh, overview of the management of the. patient and if required to stabilize the plasma pharesis dialysis ecmo they are also required this is all is to stabilize all systems yes regarding step 4 antibiotic plus minus antifungals when do you decide to add antifungals in such patients so uh, in the first few days generally antifungals are not required right. antibiotic for uh, even like you you antibiotic if you are planning any really invasive procedures like putting okay. lines putting on the ventilator putting the yes. dialysis catheter Yes. Otherwise, if you are not doing invasive procedure, basic antibiotics may or may not be given. Antifungal, if the stay is getting prolonged for more than few days, then antifungals can be added. Okay. What are the causes of mortality in acute liver failure in children? So, if you so this is very nice diagram. If you see, so this may not be applied. Uh, so, if this this pie diagram shows that how frequent what are the commonest cause. can yes. see most of this uh, uh, reason for referral is that prolonged inr but right. actual bleeding the percentage is very small the major causes of bleeding in the initial first few days that is 3 to 4 days is a raised icp you are not able to manage intracranial patient the patient will cone and die so that's right. why the all those steps that we just discussed are very important later on if so as the liver fails then the multi organ of system failure sets and that is the another major causes of the liver so, uh, of the uh, death in the liver failure and if you are able to salvage and the patient stays for a longer duration there is a bacterial translocation from the intestine and that cause infection and the patient can die so what we have to do is if this pie diagram you see when the so we have to manage intracranial pressure prevent bleeding and wait for regeneration moment we think that there is a multi organ failure is about to set and this means conservatively we are not able to manage we have to do a transplant over there and at the any cost we have to prevent infection because infection is sir, there case side smita yes sir difficult to salvage the patient so that's what this uh, this that's how we interpret this causes of mortality and use in the management sir. 
uh, and how the raised ICT should be monitored and uh, treated in acutely or severe. Acutely or severe. Ideally, like pl placing an intracranial uh, catheters is very uh, life threatening in ALF, so that can be non-invasively monitor by one thing is seeing the papillary edema. Another way to monitor is an optic sheet, optic no sheet diameter. It is in any ICU where the ultrasound is there, a diameter of the optic sheet can be monitored in infants. So it is just measured at 3 mm posterior to the, the posterior pole of the eye globe. And uh, if, uh, if it is more than 4 in infants, more than 4.5 in children and more than 5 mm in adult, it is suggestive of raised ICT. This is a very uh, reproducible tool and easily available. Other, uh, so uh, can you have a next slide please? Yes. Now if you see, the ammonia is most important factor in managing active diabetes. If your ammonia is more, if this is a capillary wear analysis and you can see if your ammonia is more than 200, then the mortality is very, very high. And if your ammonia is less than 100, then mortality is less. So what kills the patient in the first few days is raised ammonia. So our, so our measure should be at lowering the ammonia and keeping it and allowing, salvaging the brain and allowing the liver to regenerate. Next slide, please. Sir. Yeah. So, so what modalities we have is basically ammonia reduction. So most effective way to reduce ammonia is removing the ammonia from the body because the entire liver has failed. Just giving a lactulose or any other, uh, so these are very a few, uh, other uh, interventions are very feeble interventions. So such a such so uh, CRRT like continuous renal, renal replacement therapy is the best way. Or even not, you can have a SLED, but because there are a lot of fluctuations, CRRT is the preferred because hemodynamically the child is stable. So we generally uh, our dictum is once the patient comes, we hydrate them. And in the 12 hours, is ammonia is rising more than 150 or more than 200. We aggressively start the patient on CRRT. Try to keep the ammonia less than 200. So to save the brain, that is the best way to save the brain. Because once it is damaged, it's permanently damaged and nothing. Even the river regenerate, we'll be giving a vegetable to the family. So that should not be done. So the lowering ammonia is very important. So just a previous slide. So this slide, this child is a very classical example. Yes. where it was so sick. So actually we are doing that at the same time plasma paresis. So there are two machines which are simultaneously placed and child was so sick that even we couldn't stop the CRRT in between. So these two machines were a tandem and we are doing simultaneous CRRT in plasma paresis to solve it. And this child was basically an NSAI uh, aspirin induced raised syndrome and his liver uh, regenerated because we could uh, uh, basically for 48 hours we could support it. Yes. So, CRRT and plasma paresis are important modalities where we can stabilize the child. Next slide, sir, please. So if you see, this is uh, like in uh, last five years, these are almost um, uh, 25 patients, uh, the 24 patients I have, so who varied right from six months of age to 17 years. And if you see the treatment column, most of them, we have used CRRT and plasma paresis together. There are the few patients where Plasma for is uh, only one uh, modalities was used, but majority both the modalities will be used. So the purpose of using CRRT is to decrease ammonia and purpose of using plasma for is to take care of the SERS component and stabilize the patient. Few can survive, few may, uh, require, majority of them still require the transplant. So what these basically inter uh, this uh, uh, cutting edge technology gives us opportunity to stabilize and prepare for the transplant. If the liver regenerates, we are happy uh, not to offer. Uh, yes, I uh, would like to ask this question to Dr. Vibor only. How is coagulopathy treated in acute liver failure children? Management of coagulopathy. So we know that the definition of the coagulopathy starts from the INR. So definitely all we get, all the patients have deranged INR. But what is the treatment target? There is no consensus on that because liver failure is a disturbed balance and INR, because both procoagulant and anticoagulant factors are deranged. So INR is it's an in vitro test. In vivo what's happening, we don't know. 
so just inr targeted therapy is not a best modality to uh, uh, treat about the 30% of the alfs has a uh, fibrolytic state so there are micro thrombi so inr doesn't help so what we do and most of the transplant center are doing is to use the thromboelastogram so next slide please so what thromboelasto uh, okay uh just next slide so generally when we uh, correct so generally we know that we given an inr uh, to correct inr with vitamin k and we give it sir so next slide so when there is a clinically uh, significant bleeding uh, very uh, high uh, inr more than 7 the platelets are very less fibrogen is less than 100 and we are planning a very invasive procedure like putting lines at that time we give one of the blood products now which to choose is important because we don't know which is the problem so, so next let me so we use a thromboelastogram so what we do in a thromboelastogram is a uh, some small uh, in, in uh, uh, the blood is taken and there is an in vitro clot formation happens and computer basically picks up this graph and plots it and that's how we know what happens so this is a typical graph and there are different different components so our time tells us that the moment the process start to the first uh, basically sign of a clot formation sir previous so that tells us about the clotting factor if this is delayed ffp can help and can take care of the bleeding now the next is basically once the clot formation starts and the clot diameter is 20 mm so that time is called as the k time and when the tangent is drawn to this curve that is called as an alpha angle now both so this tells you about how speedily the clot is formed so if this angle is good means and that is the function of the fibrin so if this angle is uh, very uh, is low it means the fibrinogen is low so in that situation cryo precipitate can uh, stop the bleeding so here ffp we may have to do very large volume of ffp third thing is the strength of the clot formation that is called the maximum amplitude if and this is generally uh, basically it is 80% its function is by platelet and only 20% by the fibrin so if your ma is less we know probably it's a platelet dysfunction again this can happen in liver failure so in this situation we give mainly the platelet and and at 30 minutes we see how much lysis is going in the clot if the lysis is more than 8% this it is in a fibrolytic state here none of your ffp is cryo precipitate and platelets going to help many of our dengue patient are in this stage there is a fibrolytic state that's why we give them doesn't help probably in those cases your tranexamic acid can help and so the uh, advantage is we know when to treat suppose your inr is 10 and your tag is normal you will not be giving any blood product and still going ahead with the invasive procedure so it saves blood product it saves the volume it helps from the transfusion reaction centrally that's how it's helpful yes and what are the indication of liver transplant in active youth as for me sir yes so yes. generally uh, for uh, for pcm poisoning we use king's college criteria other criteria they are not not uh, very well studied or if uh, are found to be consistent in children so if inr is more than 4 or factor 5 less than 30 we prepare them for a liver it's very straight forward no use of uh, no need of using any fancy formula yes i uh, go to dr vishnu a child with chronic liver disease what investigation should be done so uh, chronic liver disease uh, if you are thinking about a chronic liver disease in terms of is it a metabolic disease like a storage or is it a, a proper uh, hepatitis form of the liver disease okay so if yeah. you are thinking about storage like a bilirubin normal just hgot hgpt increase a hepatomegaly or hepatosplenomegaly think about storage and the most common storage is a glycogen storage disease right. so what i will do in glycogen storage disease is one i will do the fasting lipid profile i along with the liver function test i will do the fasting lipid profile i will see what the glucose is i will see what is the uric acid there so that i know that he, am i dealing with the glycogen storage disease or not if if there is another diseases where the primarily liver is like a, a secondary involvement like a 
spleno hepatomegaly then i am thinking about more like a lysosomal storage disease so if i think think about a lysosomal storage disease then i would be better to do the lysosomal storage enzyme activity or a cytotriacetase okay right but if it is a hepatitis form of the liver disease and the third liver disease or third part would be uh, what i would say is the ascitic form so the ascitic form of chronic liver disease so there the the differential is either a bird cherry a right sided heart failure or a problem with the ivc web or something so my investigation there would be more like a doppler of hepatic vein and ivc okay so th these are the two extremes and the third is the commonest form where the little bit increase in the bilirubin the albumin is on the lower side the hgot hgpt are in the 100 and child is having hepatomegaly or hepatosplenomegaly or only splenomegaly or a splenomegaly with ascites so here the differential which i would like to put in western maharashtra first is wilson second is autoimmune the third is bird cherry and the last or the most uncommon again it will be hepatitis b and c so hepatitis b and c will not decompensate uh, these children will not have a cirrhosis in first decade or second decade they will have the cirrhosis or the the effect of hepatitis b and c in third or fourth decade so these are not the commonest cause and another group which probably like in neonatal cholestasis we are seeing lot of lot of patients of pfic presenting in the 6 year 7 year with a chronic liver disease so that group is also needs to be studied so the investigation is according to what category they have and the wilson workup will we include all three parameters ophthalmological examination for kf ring a serum seroloplasmin not the copper and 24 hour urine copper not the serum or blood copper so all these three things to be done a, when we are suspecting wilson in autoimmune liver disease the simplest investigation is doing serum igg levels if serum igg is very high there then there is a highly possibility of and, and you see the globulin on the higher side on the liver function test other tests are the autoimmune liver profile which includes ana by if method so whenever we are ordering ana be it for the rheumatological cause be it for the liver it has to be if method indirect immunofluorescence and the other other markers like sma antibody lk1 antibody so there will be panel of the test when we are ordering the investigation for chronic liver disease right right dr vibhor uh, what is the role of liver biopsy in chronic liver disease so yes. for a liver disease as uh, just now dr vishnu has said that for wilson liver biopsy is not required again pfic diagnosed on the genetics autoimmune liver disease is the condition where you need a liver biopsy to diagnose sometimes closing cholangitis to see the intrahepatic component and all you need a liver biopsy otherwise the liver biopsy is generally tells us about the damage in very few instances it tells you about the etiology so once you have the etiology then probably liver biopsy is not required sometimes you need a liver biopsy to confirm that there is an ongoing cirrhosis for example we have got an extrahepatic portal vein obstruction who is not very typical in that scenario we may need liver biopsy to confirm a non cirrhotic portal fibrosis we may need liver biopsy so uh in in sometimes bird carry which are not the typical presentation of ascites sometimes they just present with hepatomegaly all over investigations is negative dopplers and uh, ct uh, and is not very characteristic in such situations the uh, liver biopsy may be helpful apart from that most of the diseases can be diagnosed nowadays on non invasive etiological uh, investigations yes every every uh, investigation has got its own fallacy how safe is liver biopsy uh, as far as these patients are concerned i mean so, uh, liver biopsy is very safe in the experience yes. center now yes. ultrasound guided liver biopsy should be done yes. there is no rule generally avoid any uh, blind biopsies there 
are complications though rare, but yes, there are in the medical today in medical legal world, everywhere ultrasound is available. Another, we should look for a uh, coagulopathy and platelet. Out yes. of INR and platelet, platelet is a problematic. If you have a low platelet, do not yes. But yes. still 50,000 right. platelets, up means above 50,000, one can safely go ahead with liver biopsy. Yes. INR, if it is little bit, then the plug biopsies can be done till it is INR is more 2.5. If it is beyond that, better to do a transjugular liver biopsy. Okay. Many of the centers are now doing it. If there is ascites, avoid it. Because sometimes they can cause problem. If there is an obstructive biliary, biliary obstruction, again avoid liver biopsies. But right. by and large, liver biopsies are very safe in right. neonates also. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Vishnu, how to monitor response of treatment in various chronic liver diseases? Yeah, so the, the response depends on the etiology. Like in Wilson disease, we monitor the copper levels, we monitor 24 hour urine copper. We monitor how the synthetic function of the liver is there. In autoimmune liver disease, we monitor the, the immunoglobulin levels. We monitor the autoantibodies. If they are very high, they are becoming negative or not. And, and we monitor the fibrosis. So, so for the fibrosis, nowadays, we are not going to repeat the liver biopsy. Means it, it was the era, maybe two decades or three decades back, when they used to do the liver biopsy to diagnose and then to monitor that is the patient responding or not and to see the grade of fibrosis. Now is the generation where there is a lot of non-invasive tests are available. So if I have to monitor the response, I will do the non-invasive test to monitor the fibrosis. So yeah. now we have a beautiful machines called as Fibroscan. We have the MRI elastography where we can see what is the grade of fibrosis and is the patient is going from uh, uh, F1, F2 fibrosis to F3, F4, or is the patient is having a fibrosis all over across the, the liver? So we can grade the liver injury uh, uh, in non-invasively nowadays. Yes. Uh, so, Dr. Vibor, yes, would you comment on this fibroscan? So look at this, the stiffness, yes. which we calculate by yes. taking the 10 different it, it is non-invasive. You have to just put the probe and put 10 times and right. see that all 10 times reveal the same uh, this thing and then take the mean of uh, all these 10 or the median and uh, it, it, in this it is showing 16.8. So you right. get a graph like this. So okay. this graph is different for a different group diseases. Like we mentioned, so glycogen storage disease, metabolic liver disease. Yes. The graph will be different. Uh, cholestatic liver disease like biliary atresia, PFIC. So the, this graph is different. The color is different. Wilson, autoimmune, the color will be different. Yes. The hepatitis B or C, the colors and the parameters will be different. So depending on the, the disease, we know that this is 16.8. Now this belongs to the F3 and F4. So it is more like a cirrhotic liver. So we need to be more aggressive in the monitoring these patients. So likewise, we monitor. And there is another technology which is called as a MRI elastography. Okay. How, how cost effective is this scan, fibro scan? Some of the centers are doing G, around 2,000 to okay. 5,000 okay. per scan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Weber, when should a child be referred to a transplantation center? As for so we are already covered uh, yes. patients who present with active liver failure. Now for chronic liver disease, yes. So once so once there is a decompensation of any liver disease, and even if you have a treatment available, for example, you are having a child with Wilson disease or autoimmune disease, but there yes. is ascites. INR is more than two. Now here the medical success rate of the medical management is sixty to seventy. So it's not hundred percent. So such patients should be referred should be treated with the medical management. If they are successfully, if you are able to divert it, then very good. But if not, then at least we have prepared for something. Uh, another is for, depending on the etiology, there are scores also, like new Wilson index score for Wilson disease. On that also we know what are the chances of this patient to respond to the treatment. 
another thing is any progressive liver disease which doesn't have a diagnosis or a treatment it is a dynamic so process is a dynamic so at some point of time it's obviously is going to basically get deranged so once we are getting that the child is getting advanced liver disease so we can quantify it by doing a pelt score less than 12 years or melt score by uh for more than 12 years now basically though they are actually they are used for listing but one can use it for uh monitoring also when to refer also if you are getting a melt score more than 16 you can refer to that child who is more than 12 years you are getting pelt score more than around 16 to 20 again this child better to refer this child for a liver uh, transplant patient similarly you are getting uh, of course we are uh, covering that again the hepato advanced hepatoblastoma also they can be uh, they should be referred for a liver transplant around uh, with the adjunct uh, new adjunct chemotherapy i think four four five things we should be remembering okay. one is if the ascites is developing okay. second if this child is having hematemesis okay yes third growth failure right. in spite of your treatment fourth if the child is having some uh, uh, complication of it like what complications we usually see so what i would advise is that look for the ascites look for the growth look for the signs of uh, hematemesis like do uh, uh, see the platelet and if possible the endoscopic evaluation to for the varices and the fourth will be saturation so what happened is many a times we see the child everything looks normal but when we take the saturation saturation is 82% 85% so that we called as a hepatopulmonary syndrome or a portopulmonary syndrome so i think these are the four parameters uh, uh, in in our uh, office practice when we see this growth failure increasing bilirubin increasing ptnr ascites uh, uh, hematemesis or the saturation going less than 92 maybe 95% if their child is having 92 93% that means there is a problem with the hepatopulmonary or portopulmonary syndrome and these are the children even look normal they should be referred for the transplant similarly yes. poor quality of life in patient with pfic yes is also significant portion their synthetic function may be good but very high uh, very is uh, intensity is so high that they are not able to even able to sleep and the metabolic complication like very high triglycerides or you are getting some other metabolic conditions which are liver based like hypertriglyceride uh, cholesterolemia but they can be referred yes and uh, coincidentally i would uh, uh, like to ask uh, one more question to both of you in fact uh, i have been seeing one patient who is a uh, four and a half months old uh, male child he has visited to both of you dr vishnu dr vipur and he is a case of undiagnosed uh, some metabolic problem and multiple investigations have been done and there is no diagnosis but ultimately the, he has got uh, a, a severe abdominal distension portal hypertension so the liver transplantation is suggested to the child and uh, father is the suitable candidate for liver transplantation so he wanted uh, some information from me he asked me is there is life danger as far as i am concerned if there whether there is danger to my life if i uh, uh, donate some piece of my liver and how much quantity of my liver is going to be uh, transplanted to my son and after transplantation what would be the life expectancy of the child and so many and what is the cost of liver transplant so specifically these four questions i would like to ask to both of you and would uh, uh, want answers from the the uh, donor has the minimum risk why yes. minimum risk is okay. because we do plenty of test plenty of investigations and plenty of referral right. to see that the suitability of the donor is there or not yes. even yes. the slightest doubt we refuse yes. the donor that okay. is one that okay. is why the donor safety is the prime thing which every center monitor yes second in pediatric age group fortunately mm. our liver requirement for the child mm. is very in grams like maximum 100 or 200 grams okay our children will be anywhere between 5 kg to 30 kg right so to 300 gram of liver is maximum which is required and okay. which can be taken from the 
left lobe of the liver. Right. So the left lobe resection, right. the mortality is very very less. Okay. The right lobe resection mortality, which is 0.2 to 0.3 percent, okay, in living related, in right, right lobe. So right. it will come around, I would say, one in three hundred to one thousand. Right. Okay, but right. for the left lobe, it is one in two thousand to five thousand. Okay. And usually in the majority, it is left lateral lobe which is taken. Okay. So the so the danger to the life is one in two thousand to three thousand. I would say. Okay. The second question was risk to the life uh, of yes. the child. Yes. Yes. Is is five percent? Okay. Two to five percent is the risk right. of death during or post surgery. Okay. Particularly in the chronic liver disease right. setting. In right. the acute liver setting, the risk is. Twenty to thirty okay. percent. The okay. recipient, the quality of life. I would say that the next picture will tell you about the quality of life. Some of the pictures are yes. from my yes. patient and the Vibor's patient. So right. look at this third picture where the mother and father are there with two children. Can you right. guess that who has got transplanted here amongst these four? The mother, father, uh, the two children. Anybody okay. can guess? Okay, it's hardly impossible to recognize that yes, who is yes. the donor and who yes. is the recipient. Right. Okay. So oh. this is what the quality of life or the the scene, and this child is going to be uh, 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 play in the Olympiads now. Oh. She is preparing for the badminton, and I this see. was the mother, and mother has donated to the child, which is just uh, uh, standing beside her. Yes. Another uh, child. This child with a Uh, toys in the hands so this child came to us with acute liver failure like vibor mentioned that there are only few centers in the country where the acute liver failure patients put on the crrt right so this child again was put on the crrt he, she was just 18 months old and she was on the crrt pre transplant during transplant and 10 days post transplant and she is what after one and a half years of the transplant Playing and normally, uh, whenever she comes, she fights with me that all the toys are she needed from my clinic. The third children, the the third child, which is the stylish child, right. this was just eight the months. The one with spectacles. Oh, yeah. Yes. And the same child with the school bag and the school uh, uniform. Okay. Okay. And okay. Can you imagine this child when came? He was the patient with blood cherry, and we did the. hepatic venoplasty lost and went to some ayurvedic and when he presented with hematemesis fortunately the resident took the saturation and he said okay, sir the saturation is 52% and this child is going to die in one hour so this child had a hepatopulmonary syndrome with 52% of the saturation and now going to the school and i, I think vibor also can mention few of his children so the quality of life is excellent if everything goes smoothly except that they need to visit every 6 monthly to a center with the liver function test and sonography and and probably they need one or two medications as of now i would say whatever has been started in 1960s so we have a 60 years of experience and with this 60 years of experience everybody says if the child goes beyond one year 90% of the chance is that this liver will stay with him for his lifetime i have seen many kids which have grown older to 25 26 year old when i was there in uk for few months and they got married they got children many of them got uh, uh, in the doctor engineer businessman and we know that the famous child from delhi who is now surgeon so the quality of life is good only thing is that the initial reluctance and i would say the reluctance from the patient's part then the patient's relatives and the major reluctance comes from the the mediator between the transplant center and the patient if i am convinced that i can give this quality of life to the children then the next time i would definitely tell the patient that ki please go ahead whatever the risk is there but there is a chance that 90 95% chance that your child will be walking talking with a good education and the with good life i so i think this slide will summarize 
the quality of life. Yes, and, no, uh, yes, doctor. Doctor, can it, enter, it, enlighten about the other patients. Yes, doctor Vishnu, uh, with these lovely kids, uh, I'm seeing on this screen uh, uh, from IAP Raigar and from uh, a moderator from me. A big applause to both of you, Dr. Vishnu and Dr. Vibhor. And in fact, three cheers. You have been doing a great job and it's a dedicated job, I'm sure. Uh, I move on. Uh, I uh, would like to uh, have thoughts from Dr. Vibhor. Which is the commonest liver tumor in pediatric age group? So, uh, the commonest liver tumor that we see in the pediatric age group is mostly the hepatoplasty. Younger age group. Uh, as we go in the second decade, then we see more of the HCC, which is hepatitis B related. Uh, even in, uh, in that age group, also we are seeing the hepatoblastomas. Where in, again, in the younger kids, the other tumor that we see is a neuroblastomas, which has been there in the liver, yolk sac tumor, sometimes even the primary hepatic lymphomas. Other these are the uh, malignant one. Benign, we are seeing hemangio endotheliomas, hepatomas, uh, sometimes just the uh, liver cysts that we see. Yes, and how to proceed once a liver mass is detected? So, uh, you know that most common uh, tumor is hepatoblastoma, uh, and the radiology is quite. Uh, indicative of that. So it can differentiate from a vascular tumor from uh, this kind of tumor. So once you have a liver mass, one should, uh, one should do a cross-sectional imaging of the abdomen with liver protocol. So we know that what are the characteristics of the liver in different phases. And the, uh, so the liver looks, the, the hepatoblastoma looks different from hemangioendotheliopathy. Depending on the age, we can know it's, it can be that it can be hepatoblastoma or HCC, so they can look quite similar. Then, doing a tumor markers like alpha lipoprotein uh, and CA99, so this can help us to what kind of tumor we are dealing with. Also, at the same time, we are doing hepatoblastoma, staging is required, so the CT chest is also required. Now, uh, there, is, uh, there are different schools of thought, but what we believe that doing a liver biopsy and having a histopathological diagnosis is very important before initiating the treatment. So once uh, so the biopsy tells, confirms the diagnosis, tells us the type of the tumor, and that uses a hint about how aggressively the tumor will be. And also by uh, doing imaging, we can do a risk stratification and further treatment can be planned. So stage, so if we do a cyopel staging, it takes one, two. So initially, a uh, low risk therapy, low uh, risk chemotherapy followed by resection is helpful. But for advanced tumors, like stage three, it takes a four. Uh, for that, new adjuvant chemotherapy reduction size. Monitoring that there is an adequate uh, log reduction in alpha phytoprotein. So such patients can one can offer. So they need the tumor mass needs to be removed because as in advanced stage, all the lobes of the liver are involved. Resection is not possible. So doing a transplant uh, is and followed by again the chemotherapy is a good modality. And up to sixty to seventy percent of uh, success rate can be achieved. Now, the most important part is sometimes people think that, okay, they can resect and if there is a recurrence, then transplant can be done. But, but this rescue liver transplant hepatoblastoma has one of the worst prognosis and that should be uh, discouraged. Even in the initial stage, if there are a localized metastasis to lungs or to a peritoneum, so that is even not a contraindication for referring these uh, patients uh, for a successful resection. So along with the transplant, even the diaphragmatic resections uh, can be done, nematomies or localized peritoneal resections can be done with the successful outcome. Uh, so that's how we uh, approach uh, to the commonest tumor that's in hepatoblastoma. So yes. I think at our center, we have done almost 18 uh, hepatoblastomas. We have done transplant. Out of that, 14 are uh, surviving and uh, four uh, died because some because of the recurrence.
so it has yes. a good uh, output yes yes uh, dr vishnu would you like to add something to this yeah only thing i would like to mention is don't do ct scan with contrast okay what happens is just doing the ct scan abdomen with contrast doesn't suffice for the abdomen what we should insist always is three phase or four phase ct scan abdomen uh, with iv contrast particularly for the liver masses and the for the pancreas and if you are doing for the gi tract then oral contrast is must so what do i mean by just with contrast and with three phase and four phase and that is very important that three phase means you have arterial portal and venous phase and four phase means you have a early arterial and late arterial so doing the ct scan when they inject the uh, contrast then after injection of the contrast they took early arterial films late arterial a portal phase and venous phase and these are the specified times the 15 seconds 25 seconds 35 seconds and maybe 50 or 60 seconds depending on the protocol so that will clinch the diagnosis about the characteristic of the tumor just plain scan and the contrast scan will not give us give us the idea that ki, is it hepatoblastoma or a hemangioendothelioma or mesenchymal hematoma or or something or just hemangioma so this doing a three phase and four phase ct scan is what is the important crux and that is i think everybody should remember liver mass not a simple scan a three phase or a four phase scan okay uh, uh, respected dr vishnu and dr vibor i always uh, prefer such a panel discussion and uh, we are at uh, the end of this panel discussion it was really wonderful wonderful panel discussion and i really enjoyed it in, in fact it was my first time uh, moderating with iip raigad with two stalwarts who are established pediatric gastroenterologist and hepatologist and it was a fun moderating this session but uh, before going for open forum which would be open for only 5 minutes because we are, we are we are already uh, having short of time so i would like dr vibhor and dr vishnu to uh, give us take home messages in few lines like five six lines uh, dr vibhor first and then dr vishnu so i will just uh, i'll mention about the topics that covered so in liver fail in uh, acute hepatitis the patient has is a non acute hepatitis can be managed conservatively without very extensive investigation patient has a jaundice is an alarm sign and we need to be cautious and take case to case basis decision but don't ignore the patient and follow up should be complete till resolution we just jaundice is invisible no we should monitor uh, we should have a normalization of lfts in alf if it is progressive prefer within time third liver transplant if required it can be offered now finances and uh, the technical uh, the skill uh, is not a problem in our part of the country successful uh, successful modalities are available to see the all the kinds of complexity of the liver disease yes dr vishnu please yeah so remember three thing neonatal cholestasis take the picture ggt pti na these are must your first differential diagnosis is biliary atresia second differential diagnosis is pfic in acute liver failure transferring early so that the transplant center has time to investigate and concentrate on the pre transplant assessment for the donor they, they, they need at least 24 to 48 hours to choose the donor and work up and complete the legality and once we complete it then you side by side managing the case if the child is decompensating and if you have a good window then you can go ahead with the transplant and that is the important crux in early referral for acute liver failure in chronic liver disease or in neonatal cholestasis even though the child has a jaundice please please vaccinate call them in the time and give all the available the uh, national scheduled vaccines 
and all the optional vaccines insist on them to take the typhoid to take the prevenar to take the hepatitis a to take the meningococcus to take the hiv they, that that should be the chicken pox is very important to vaccinate them because that is the thing which we can help by preventing the infection if the chronic liver disease patient you took a, uh, you put the patient in the baskets without jaundice metabolic cause with ascites a bird cherry and in between the hepatitis form you work up for wilson and atomin wilson is the commonest second commonest is atomin and you do, you should do the complete work up and you when you start the treatment then there are very few diseases which require the invasive liver biopsy yes only in atomin liver disease and biliary atresia and whenever the child decompensate in form of hematemesis ascites growth failure or a complications then they should be referred to the transplant center and we should be educating all of us our colleagues and the patient that the quality of life is good and the as we were said cost is not the hindrance hindrance is the acceptability and going ahead that is the major hindrance yes thank you dr vishnu dr vibho in fact we are heading for an open forum but since time is less i would like either neha or uh, dr dhananjay to take over but uh, before that i would like to uh, invite openly to both the faculties if just in case you happen to come to alibab it's a tourist tourist place fondly known as mini goa so yes. if just in case you happen to come to alibab do visit our home and house to take a chai with dr sandorkar yeah thank, thank you, you very sir. much we are honored sir. <laughs> mike belongs to uh, doc, either dr neha or dr dhananjay uh, please yes uh, it was a really fantastic session both the experts were excellent and they enlightened us with their knowledge today chandurkar sir made the session very interactive uh, now i request our secretary dr dhananjay rajput sir to for the vote of thanks over to you sir thank you madam uh, today is world liver day and on this occasion we had we had wonderful panel discussion by two eminent pediatric gastroenterologist and hepatologist dr vibhor borkar sir and dr vishnu biradar sir uh, thank you both of you sir uh, for your our all the queries in depth uh, th thank sincere thanks once again uh i sincerely thank dr rajendra chandorkar sir and dr neha madam for the wonderful moderation it was very crisp and very smooth uh i sincerely thank our president dr pramod wankhede sir and dr vikas mori sir the vice president for organizing this uh, wonderful panel discussion sincere thanks to dr jain sir uh, dr bhandarkar madam uh, and all the dignitaries who have attended this session and finally sincere thanks to dr vishal rao sir for uh, making the uh, for providing the zoom platform uh, for this session sincere thanks to again all of you thank you thank you very much thank you